First of all, thank you so much for coming all the way to Texas at the end of your semester. And the second is this room is like weirdly formal and large. Um, so I'm going to try to not make this formal just because of the fanciness of the room. Um, so there's, this is like overlapping Venn diagrams of social networks. And so what we want to start off by doing is just making sure that everyone knows who everyone else is. So if we could go around the room and you could just describe well, your name and um, what department you're coming from and um, a little bit about what you do, like what is your intersection into what we're talking about today. Um, and if you have something that you're kind of hoping to get out of this meeting, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and if that's not clear to you what you're hoping to get out of this meeting, that's also, that's also cool too. Um, and yeah, do you have anything to add? Yeah, we're just we're thrilled you're all here. Thank you so much yeah. for taking a leap of faith and coming to a meeting with a kind of weird conglomeration of topics. And we hope it's really fruitful and generative and, and we'll provide some background for that in a moment. But now we'd love to hear kind of who you are, where you're coming from, and what you hope to learn uh, today. All right. Oh, I won't make Marguerite go first. Uh, she's still she's she's our trainee. So we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris Bryan. Uh, I'm a social psychologist, uh, and I work at the business school at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I study interventions. Uh, I, most of what I do is in the area of persuasion and influence, and so I uh, design mostly messaging interventions that could be scaled quite easily. Um, that are intended to get people to do the things they know they should do, but often can't muster the motivation to do. And what do you hope to learn? Uh, I would like to learn, uh, so I've, I fall under the interventions part of that uh, title. I'd like to learn more about the genes part in particular. I know, I know a little bit about neighborhoods, but the genes part is, is way outside of my expertise, so I'd love to, to just understand how that intersects with things in there. I'm uh, Patrick Kirby. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Broad Institute. Um, I got my PhD in economics, however, uh, and so I kind of live in the intersection of, of a lot of these things. Um, I, when, when I meet people, I usually tell them I'm a statistical geneticist, though, because that's a little bit closer to what I spend my day-to-day -day stuff doing. Um, I'm really interested generally in, in um, thinking about how to uh, apply genetic data to social science type questions and methodological uh, concerns around uh, those, those types of problems. Um, my, I, I, I don't know, I'm excited just to kind of meet people, see what they're doing. Um, I, I, I like collaborative and projects and uh, thinking of how, how we can work together to solve interesting problems. Great. I'm Elliot Tucker Draub. I, uh, I'm an associate professor here at UT. Um, I uh, do work on genetics and education, and I am very interested in um, uh, experiences and policies that affect cognitive development and academic achievement, but almost all of my work to date has not focused on um, uh, randomized interventions. So I've been trying to make inferences using naturally occurring data about the roles of things that are potentially intervenable and how they intersect with genetics and interact with genetics. Um, and so I work both in the uh, on the genetic side in in, uh, in respect to twin models, and then also I do molecular genetic work. So statistical genetics. Patrick. Um, I can start the page. This Twin Project here in Texas, and all the Texas Twin Project. And yeah, and what uh, I, I suppose that the, I have, I, so, so a while ago I actually started thinking about the role of uh, heterogeneity in treatment effects, and I like, wrote a paper about how one might go about doing that, but I never actually applied it, and that's the sort of thing that I have actually long been interested in, but I would love to actually talk to people who know about interventions that work and how to implement them and how to, and, you know, think, think about, you know, correlates of treatment effects for individuals or for more macro level uh, and, uh, subpopulations. So I, that's what I'm hoping to develop more over the next few days. Great. Hi, 
Hi everyone, I'm Pietro Giraldi. I'm an assistant professor in economics at the University of Zurich. I am an economist and I do stuff on uh, uh, genetics and uh, uh, I would say health and human capital, which is a catch all term, but I'm going to take it and it's good enough. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've done uh, most of the things on the genes part, not really on the neighborhoods part. But I, I am, uh, I have, I'm starting now to write a few papers on interventions that are not connected to genes. And so from this, uh, in this meeting, I would like to understand more of, uh, I didn't want to say heterogeneity of treatment effects, because it sounds like a too technical of a word, but that's definitely what I'm interested in right now. So heterogeneity of treatment effects and how genes can help us understand that form of heterogeneity. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm Drew Bailey. I'm in the School of Education at the, uh, UC Irvine, and I, uh, I, I've been studying uh, kind of the, the medium and long-term. I'm a developmental psychologist. I've been studying the medium and long-term effects of educational interventions and uh, 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 using uh, models from non-experimental data that can kind of forecast the long, the medium, and long-term effects of these interventions why they often don't match the predictions from the correlational models and the experimental data and what we can do to make them match. So I think, I think there's some uh, uh, similarities between that work and some, some methods that they, they, uh, quantitative geneticists are using nowadays. So uh, I'm interested in learning from you. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's it. <clears throat> I'm Rob Prosnow. I'm the chair of the sociology department here in Texas, and within sociology, my main area is educational context and inequality. But I think my main field in general is child and adolescent development, which is my entree to the genetic literature. Um, and I'm also with David, one of the leaders of the national. Uh, I can never remember what it's called. National <laughs> Learning Mindsets. Um, <laughs> Which is, I still tell you, the national uh, experimental evaluation of an educational intervention. Uh, so I'm Candace Rogers. I'm a psychologist at the University of California Irvine with Drew. Um, I study mostly adolescent development and mental health, and we've worked on neighborhood work, also on some twin studies, um, and more recently follow kids around on their mobile phones doing day to day variation and experiences and uh, mental health. And I'm I'm interested um, in understanding, I've worked on a lot of interdisciplinary teams and include genetics and I've thought about genetics in a research context, but interested in learning how people are thinking about now making genetic information potentially relevant for interventions, given that it's often not a palatable thing to do. Um, and and uh, I think we're kind of at this unique nexus where we're getting enough predictive power that it might be useful, but there's some real cost benefits. So interested in perspectives from Hi, my name is Kepe Yamamoto. I'm an associate professor at MIT. Um, I'm a political scientist, so I know nothing about genes. I know nothing about education either. So why am I here? Well, <laughs> partially uh, because I work with David on the project, but also like uh, that's actually related to this uh, conference. But also because I'm uh, half of my me is actually a statistician, so I work on methods for causal inference. Uh, where I work on um, you know. Um, a causal inference techniques for causal inference and those are called effective for um, uh, you know uh, interventional studies and those experiments and also I, I work on experimental designs, survey designs and so forth. And you know um, um, so one thing that I'm particularly interested in now is how we can use that pretreatment covariate data um, like genes to um, you know, make inference about the causal mechanisms uh, you know with which the treatment actually the outcome variable. So um, you know, I'm very much hoping to learn the, you know, um, kind of the potential of using genetic data to actually make this kind of inference you know, more credible and you know, more powerful. Um, so I'm Alex Burt. I'm a professor of psychology at Michigan State. Um, so I actually feel like I have um, some knowledge about all three of those topics. So um, I did <clears throat> my PhD at the University of Minnesota where I was in both the behavior genetics program and the clinical psychology program. So I feel like I, I, you know, I have my hands in both kind of the gene piece and the intervention piece. Um, and then most recently, my um, so historically, I've been interested in gene environment interplay in the development of antisocial behavior or delinquency. 
Um, but most recently, I've gotten really into uh, neighborhood, actually, and I've been doing, um, I've got a couple of grants funded now looking at um, kind of the biological embedding of neighborhood disadvantage and how it shapes brain development. And then because they're twins, we can also look at kind of the gene environment interplay underlying that embedding. Um, uh, that's not why I'm here, though. Um, that is actually my major research focus. The reason I'm here is because I have a small grant where um, I have also been really interested in sort of the heterogeneity of um, intervention outcomes, um, and I've long wanted to do a twin study to see to figure out, you know, sort of ge how genetic and environmental influences on a given phenotype might change following an intervention. And so I am doing that now, um, and our intervention is a mindset intervention, and so we're looking at, we've got pre and post measures, and they do a mindset intervention in their twins, and so we're able to look at um, changes in heritability, and it's all done within a, a one hour period, uh, it's an online intervention, and we are seeing changes in heritability. Spoiler. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> I didn't know you were doing results. So I'm Coulter Mitchell uh, at the University of Michigan, the Institute for Social Research. Um, and I got my PhD in sociology and statistics. Um, but I actually say I'm a demographer or a biodemographer. Um, I work on uh, lots of different studies, helping them to collect and analyze uh, genomic data, um, such as the fragile family studies, panel study of income dynamics, health and retirement study, Chitwan Valley family study, and twins. Yeah, uh, he's on the neighborhood project. Um, and, uh, but my main focus for research is looking at how uh, neighborhoods and social contexts influence uh, child development mostly, but now a little bit into aging as well, and how that interacts with uh, molecular measures and neuroimaging measures. Um, and I think, the reason, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I'm here is because uh, Paige, Dan, Pietro, and I wrote this beautiful, <laughs> beautiful proposal <laughs> to uh, an Italian foundation on why they might want to collect uh, genetics as part of several of their intervention studies. Um, we're still waiting to hear from them, right? <laughs> but it was beautiful. I'm pushing them. <laughs> I'm trying. So, so I, I'm very, that's the part I think I'm the most interested in, is the intervention side, uh, just learning more about that, and then also thinking carefully about how, because I, mean, I think there's many ways to use these that are probably, uh, you know, without being as controversial as maybe some people might think. Uh, so I'm Dan Belsky. I've already managed to lose my name tag, so <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, I had it for a good 30 seconds this morning. It's probably out of a table outside. Um, I, uh, as of Saturday, will be uh, an assistant professor in the School of Public Health at uh, Columbia in the Department of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. Uh, but uh, until Saturday, I'm at Duke in the School of Medicine in the Department of Health Sciences. Um, I uh, do work on all of these things, uh, particularly genetics, uh, where I study genetic influence on human development. Um, and most recently, uh, genetics discovered in genome-wide association studies of educational attainment and how they affect uh, psychological behavioral development and, and processes like course social attainment. Um, uh, I'm collaborating with Candace, who's teaching me something about <coughs> neighborhood research. Um, uh, and uh, I also have been working with an intervention, although it's a caloric restriction intervention, so more on the biomedical side. So I, I think uh, I'm here to uh, I'm particularly interested in learning about interventions that work. People ask me periodically what kinds of interventions can we deliver to children that will actually change uh, their development. Uh, I don't have great answers to that question, so I hope to come away from this meeting with some of those. Um, and I'm also excited to learn from all of you about uh, the work that you do. Uh, you learn more about neighborhoods. I'm very excited about you know, causal inference, heterogeneity treatment effects, uh, and what we can do with, with genetics in that domain. I'm Margarita Malanchini, and I am a postdoc with uh, Paige and Elliot here at UT. Um, my work is in genetics and education, and um, particularly on the non-cognitive um, side of education attainment, so motivation, anxiety. Um, and my interest is really in, the, in how genetic predisposition is translated into phenotypic variation in cognition and learning. So, the biological path, the biological and environmental pathways that uh, 
link for disposition to observe variation and I guess interventions fit into these uh, environmental uh, pathways. So I'm here to learn as much as I can from <laughs> everybody. All right. Should we introduce ourselves? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Paige, I'm a psychologist, um, and I'll tell you a little bit, um, I, I, other than my training in clinical psychology, I've never done intervention work. Um, my stuff has been similar to Elliot's in terms of genetic influences on child and adolescent development, um, both uh, mental health psychiatry related, but also cognition and academic achievement. Um, and my interest in interventions has really grown out of um, being in the psych department and um, being colleagues with people like David, being friends with people like David, hearing what they're doing, and thinking there seems to be a link here. There's, there's, there's something fruitful at this intersection, but yet this also feels hard and underspecified. And how can we begin to bridge that gap? So. Um, this, this meeting is, I mean, I was telling people last night that this meeting is kind of a selfish endeavor in which I was, you know, thinking we have been having this intermittent conversation about how do genes and interventions intersect with one another, um, and now we have this opportunity to basically bring together people um, who we all think are doing great work and we all think are really smart and nice and basically getting, tasking them with um, how can you help us think through um, what are the, the practical obstacles, what are the theoretical obstacles, and how can we um, move this from a hypothetical area of research to something that's kind of more pragmatic and meaningful and, um, and more empirically grounded. So that's my motivation in, in bringing you all here. And I'm David Yeager, I'm a developmental psychologist. Uh, I, uh, I, kind of, I come to developmental psychology from being a middle school teacher. And I was very, very mediocre at that job. And I had lots of experiences of not feeling like I could sufficiently motivate my kids and became obsessed with the experimental method as a way to say, um, here's, if you say this, it can work better than that. And so most of my work is in, is in experiments so I can give practical advice to teachers. But as I've gone from that kind of very applied focus which brought me into the theoretical work and thought more broadly about human development, then I've become exposed and kind of like obsessed with Paige's work on genetic influences in development and Elliot wrote this amazing chapter on the transactional model that like just blew my mind about how like genes and environment like that that the environment can be a mediator of genetic effects which sounds obvious probably to everyone's genetics but like for me it was it was really striking um, and so I kind of had long wanted to be able to take my interests in uh, providing useful advice to people in education settings into broader theories of human development. And so we, as we've tested interventions at larger and larger scale and then started collaborations with, with Rob and other sociologists and, and focus on neighborhoods, um, it, the focus on genetics has been missing. And so again, selfishly, when, when Valerie emailed me I said and said, would you like to host a meeting? And, and I said, well, here's something I know very little about. And I'm, I'm kind of afraid to even write a proposal or say anything out loud about genetics without sounding just so poorly informed. And I think that if, if I feel that way, there have to be other people in the interventions world who feel that way. And there have to be people in the non-interventions world who don't necessarily know how we think about interventions and that there might be a sim an opposite thing. So our hope is to create a space where um, we could ask questions that might seem ridiculously novice. Um, but ultimately end up with kind of kicking the tires on um, uh, the possibility that there's a productive research agenda that could be at the intersection of these things. And so we thought, well, who are people who will, you know, give the tires a really good kick? And, you know, and who are the people who have, you know, started touching different parts of the elephant? And our hope is that... Um, I didn't know the elephant had Oh, you didn't know there's... there's gonna be, we're going to have an explosion of metaphors. <laughs> so, um, but the... Uh, um, but it, it, and, and, then, and then the final thought was to say, well, what's a practical outcome besides just the intellectual exercise? Well, a practical outcome of this meeting might be um, guidance for funders who might want to support research like this, where we've thought through, at least, or at least begun to think through some of the common objections 
and also some of the common opportunities. So experiences like yours, like what, what's a white paper that a funder could um, uh, endorse or, or give us feedback on? And so we had invited someone from the Arnold Foundation who was, go was going to come, but it turns out their holiday party got rescheduled, so he can't come. <laughs> but he has promised to follow up with us, and then Adam Gameron from the Lincoln Grant Foundation has also promised to follow up with us. So we plan on taking notes from this meeting to funders and then get advice from them on how we might engage the funding community going forward. So, um, and that might be, you might write grants with other people, but people not in the room, but we think that kind of a rising tide could raise all ships. Um, and so that's, that's the really practical um, potential outcome from, from this meeting. Um, so I, what we wanted to do now is just give um, a little, I guess dive into a little bit more background in terms of um, how this particular meeting came to be. Um, and um, my perspective as someone who's, who's not in the intervention world and grounded in the genetics world, um, what is some of the theoretical history behind why I think this particular intersection of fields is, is controversial um, and has provide an opportunity to surface some of the most obvious objections or concerns about um, why, why is this as, a, as an intersection something that, um, that isn't really common? Why, why is genetics not important into interventions or interventions into, into genetically informed samples? Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that from the, uh, kind of from the gene side of it. And then um, David has some comments about this from the, how he's thinking about interventions. Um, and then Rob is also going to give us some comments about, from the sociological perspective, you know, how does thinking about context play into both of these um, things? Yeah, and then just to, just to really quickly overdo the schedule, the hope is that we can set the stage at, a, at an abstract level, but then we actually want to spend uh, until 10 o'clock surfacing either objections or questions that people in the room have or that people in the room have heard. So that way we can s kind of get on the, on the table things that uh, may have sus led people to suspect that this intersection is a non-starter to begin with. And just kind of start with that. And then we want to break into thematic groups where people can kind of um, aggregate the information that you think is the kind of key findings from your area of the field. And then the way we'll structure the rest of our time together is to share out, but it'll hopefully be in the context of these, these initial themes we've, we've laid out. And then hopefully we can wrap up with what are some productive ways to uh, inform the research agenda in this field. Um, okay, so, so as I said part of the motivation behind this meeting was just David and I being really good friends and me hearing about what he's doing. Um, I would say another motivation behind it was an experience that um, Coulter and Dan and I had at Jakob's this year um, in which um, one of our colleagues, Greg Duncan, who cannot be here unfortunately but might Skype in at one point in time, was talking about the lovely intervention study that he is planning, which will be cash transfers for low-income mothers. Um, and at some point in time, when he was listing all the different types of data he was collecting, either Dan or Coulter and I, I don't remember who was the first person who harassed him about this, said, well, tell me about your plans to genotype the sample. Um, to which Greg responded, oh, we're not planning on genotyping the sample. Um, and so then we ended up in this kind of four-day conversation about um, why we thought that was a good idea intuitively and why he thought that was not a good idea intuitively. Um, and it made me realize just really how far apart the, 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 those fields were in terms of what we thought were important pieces of data, um, relevant pieces of data, controversial pieces of data. Um, and, I, and I don't say that to be critical of Greg in any way. I think it was an incredibly productive and useful conversation for me to think about, um, I think of it collecting genetic data as something that is like increasingly cheap and easy and non-invasive and why wouldn't you do it? And it was such an excellent opportunity to surface some of the concerns around doing that. Um, so that was the other um, experience. And then um, as, uh, uh, you all mentioned, we wrote this tiny proposal 
to say, well, other people are already have RCTs going, they have interventions going, um, it would be an easy add-on to genotype people that are currently involved in interventions. Um, and as we were putting together that proposal, it was really apparent how little empirical research there was to draw on in order to, to make the case why people should do this. So we had some hypotheticals, we had some simulations, um, but in terms of really thinking about what is the real value add for, for integrating genetic information from the perspective of people who are currently running interventions, we realized just how um, small that literature base was, both theoretically and empirically to draw on. Um, so what I want to do now is to, is to talk about um, my perspective on, on part of why that is. So why, are, why is genetics and interventions, why are those fields so far apart? Why is the theoretical and empirical base on those things so thin? Um, and I, I wanted to approach this from a historical perspective of um, how has the, the role of genes in intervention been framed um, in the past 50 years? And how has that, I think, really constrained our thinking about how to move forward productively with using genetic information? Um, so I, I mean, I think in the educational world, if you're thinking about genes and interventions, um, the legacy of, of Art Jensen, I think, really looms over this entire field. So, um, so in the 1960s, Art Jensen wrote this um, a controversial as an understatement paper um, in which he argued that because intelligence and academic achievement were heritable based on early twin studies, um, that it was going to be difficult, if not impossible, to boost intelligence or boost scholastic achievement, and in particular to narrow um, racial gaps in grades or test scores. And I think this paper was a landmark for, for multiple reasons. And I think, so first, it was um, the, one of the first post-World War II public statements in which genetics were reintroduced as relevant for social policy. So in the wake of World War II, there was kind of a strong pause on talking about genetics as relevant for social policy in the wake of the eugenics movement. And art really um, reanimated that conversation in part with this article saying, I, we're bringing genetics back to the table as relevant for social policy. Um, the second is that um, it was from the beginning tied to um, tied to questions about racial differences, the causes of racial differences, and the, the effectiveness of civil rights era policies to close racial, racial gaps, racialized gaps in IQ and grades. Um, so, and, and then the third thing is that it framed the conversation as genetics means that interventions are gonna be ineffective. Um, so set up this dichotomy between the magnitude of the heritability of something and whether or not we have any hope for interventions being effective. Um, so I think the, that as a frame, that genetics as opposed to the effectiveness of intervention and genetics as opposed to intervention specifically targeted towards racial gaps um, or racialized inequities in America, I think that framing has hovered over this intersection of fields for the past 50 years. And I think it's been really, really hard to move beyond this, gens this original Jensen formulation of things. Um, okay, so obviously Jensen was, was hugely controversial at the time and animated some responses that I also think have been influential in the social sciences in terms of how people perceive genetics research. So um, this is Goldberger writing in the 1970s um, in which he says, you know, this fascination with heritability arises from the notion that this has some relevance for social policy. And then goes on to argue the exact opposite, that heritability is irrelevant for social policy and that this, um, this Jensen formulation of heritability as putting like an upper bound on the effectiveness of interventions is flawed. Um, and he gave 
this famous example of eyeglasses in that paper, which um, I think that pretty much every talk I've ever given in my career, at least someone has like mentioned this. <laughs> um, so he basically said, it doesn't matter what the, the causes of poor eyesight are, we can have you know, biological or genetic causes of poor eyesight, but we can give people eyeglasses. And that is a, an intervention that is no more or less effective simply because poor eyesight is heritable. So really, I think a, like a lovely, easily accessible answer to the Jensen framing that heritability poses an upper bound on the effectiveness of interventions. Um, joining Goldberger from the economics literature um, with Sandy Jinks from the sociological literature, also in the 1970s, um, also arguing that heritability doesn't mean that social processes aren't important, or the interventions will be ineffective. And um, joining the eyeglasses metaphor, he gave this other example, this other thought experiment about redheaded children. So he argued that, well, if we lived in a dystopian society in which redheaded children weren't allowed to go to school, um, redheadedness is caused by genetic variation, that phenotype would then attract a social response that would result in a genetic influence on cognition or academic achievement, um, but not because of some inherent property of the child's nervous system, but because of some observable phenotype that's eliciting a social response. Um, and so really, I think, introducing the idea um, that Elliot's continued in some of his work about environmentally mediated genetic effects, that the pathway between genotype and phenotype um, depends on and is mediated through some response from the social environment. Um, okay, so uh, this, you know, Goldberger and Jinx were both writing in the 70s, so this is 40 years ago, um, and these two examples of eyeglasses in red-headed children I think have been extraordinarily persistent, right? These are really, really sticky metaphors. Um, you, hear, you hear people bring this up in terms of how to interpret heritability coefficients or whether we should be, whether twin research is relevant for social policy um, regularly, right? So, and I think it's interesting to think about why two small examples buried in papers and chapters from the 70s have taken on this sort of persistence over time, this appeal. What is the appeal of these Jinx Goldberger critiques <coughs> of Jensenism? Um, so I think there's two, two general reasons why these examples have been so appealing for people. Um, and the first is this idea that um, social processes, that the mechanisms linking genetic variation with educational outcomes could be social processes that we agree are unfair and that would be a, there would be a lot of consensus around changing. So I think this, this is really encapsulated in Jinx's redheaded child example, right? Like, regardless of political ideology, people probably don't think that we should say redheaded children can't go to school. Like that seems obviously unfair and biased. And so it's an example in which it's a social process that we can, we can easily think that everyone would want to change. You don't have to peer under the hood too much about people's value systems in order to get them to agree that not sending redheaded kids to school is unfair. Um, with the eyeglasses example, that's not about a social process, but implies that the possibility of um, that the mechanisms linking genetic variation with educational outcome might not be social. They might be, be these biological processes. I mean, genes to poor eyesight is about the curvature of your eyes, right? That's not a social process. Uh, but that those biological processes are ameliorable with cheap, scalable interventions applied late in development, right? Like eyeglasses are things in which we can give them to people easily um, we can give them to people in adulthood. Um, we can think of this as maybe an intervention with like the ultimate fade out effect, like the moment you take them off, you can no longer see. 
Um, but they're, they're not something that we are going to have to intensively change about the structure of society in order to intervene in um, I think the other reason why this James Goldberger um, critique has been so persistent and appealing is because um, it implies that interventions are going to do multiple things. Right? So if we changed our society such that red-headed children are now allowed to go to school, or if we pass out eyeglasses to people, these are interventions that really are severing the genotype-phenotype association, right? Now the genes for red-headedness no longer predict how far you go in school. Now the genes for myopia no longer predict your actual ability to see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so they are things that are just disrupting that genotype phenotype association. They're raising mean levels in the population. Every, you know, on average, people can see better in a society in which there's glasses. Um, but because those, those genotype phenotype associations are severed, um, they are interventions uh, that would eliminate or reorder genetically associated inequalities in the population. Right? So in a world in which um, red-headed children are not allowed to go to school, the rank ordering of how far people go, to, go in school is going to be different than that rank ordering that we would see in a, in a society in which we've changed those social processes in some way. Um, so there's, if, you, if you think about those examples, there's a lot implied about what interventions are going to do and how much sort of consensus support they would be for changing the social, changing these social mechanisms and so on. Um, I think we can push this a step further. This is my kind of my personal interest, which is then to think, well, so why are these things appealing to people? Like these these models of red-headed children and eyeglasses imply this about the promise of intervention. Why is this something that's appealing to people? Um, Peter Singer had an argument about this um, in a book that he wrote in the late 90s, which is basically that um, he yeah, argued can I ask that. A question yeah. Yeah. Um, Go so for it. From an intervention perspective, yeah. is it, do we need the genetic information? <coughs> we have the phenotype, right? Yeah. We have that you can't see, and we have, I think this is the interventionist response. Yeah. We know that the child is a red and there's a systematic yeah. discrimination. We yeah. know that you can't see, so we can intervene. Yeah. So the signal is there. Yeah. What's the value of knowing whether that's because I dyed my hair red or yeah. because it's biologically driven? Yeah. So I, I think that's a I think that's a really good question. I think from this example, there's nothing specific about genetic information. And I think to some extent that was the Goldberg Jinx critique, right? That we could change things like that that things being heritable didn't tell us about the response to intervention. And also, we don't need genetic information to intervene. I mean, they're really arguing that genetics is, is irrelevant, full stop, to social policy. So I think from this perspective, there isn't anything value added about genetic information. Um, I think whether they're right about that, or actually, I would reframe that question of, is genetic information valuable over phenotypic information to um, and I think this is something that would be interesting to think about it as a group. It's under what circumstances or for which types of problems is genetic information likely to be more a value add over phenotypic information. I mean, I think this also makes assumptions about the way that um, the way that interventions would work. In this case, would be to stamp out genetic yeah. influences, and I don't I don't know that that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, 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 that's where I'm so, going. At all clear, yeah. that, that is what the intervention is. Yeah. Um, yes, so I, I mean, I think you're right about that. Like, I think these are two sticky examples that people commonly refer to when they're making the argument that genetics is irrelevant to intervention or irrelevant to social policy. Um, but those examples imply a model of what interventions are doing vis-a-vis -vis genetic differences that I, I agree with you. Um, I don't know if we have very strong evidence for. Um, okay, so thinking about, you know, thinking about these two examples of Jinx Goldberger's critique 40 years later, um, that's one way in which the world could work, but what are other ways in which the world could work um, 
what are alternative possibilities. Um, so I think one alternative possibility is that there are social processes that link genetic variation with educational outcome. Um, but there, there are social processes for which there would be disagreement about whether or not they're fair or unfair or whether they should be changed or not changed. Um, so this is something, um, for instance, Dan and Rob and I have been working on a paper looking at um, polygenic scores of genetic variants associated with educational attainment in relationship to um, math curricular choices and um, placement in more advanced math in high school, right? So if you think about, you know, part of the reason why genotypes ultimately come to be associated with how far you go in school is that kids who are genetically different are placed into harder math classes. Is that fair or unfair? Is that a social process that we would want to intervene? Is that a social process that actually, like, we would consider meritocratic and a good sign? Um, I think I think this idea that the social processes that are connecting genotype to phenotype are going to be people are going to obviously agree and have consistent values about whether or not we should we should intervene to change them. Um, I think that's a, I think that's I think that's a lot harder than the redheaded child example makes us think about. Um, there's a lot of social processes that might that might link these things, but that we justify as a society as meritocratic in some way, that we're appealing to some like individual difference in the ability of the child. Um, do we do we think that's fair or unfair? Is I think that's a tougher question. Um, I think the second alternative is that they are the mechanisms linking genes with educational outcomes are biological processes um, that aren't ameliorable with cheap, scalable interventions applied in post-pubertal children, right, or late in development. Like, what if they're only ameliorable with really expensive, intensive interventions that are applied early? Um, I mean, this is part of why I'm so interested in what David is doing, is that I think often in the educational context, when we talk about the intersection between genes and environments, the examples that come up are really intensive boutique interventions, right? They're like Perry preschool um, that are applied early in development and involve a lot of social changes. Um, he's working on more, you know, light touch, <coughs> nudge interventions that, that, you know, are used with adolescents, um, which I think are much more analogous to eyeglasses than Perry preschool is. Um, uh, the other kind of ways in which the world might differ from the Gene Spielberger formulation is that interventions might raise mean levels in the population, but actually magnify genotype phenotype associations. So if the people who are um, most likely to have good outcomes in the first place are also most responsive to the interventions, then we might be exacerbating, that implies that they're bad, magnifying differences by genotype rather than reducing them. Um, and in so doing, we're not reordering anyone. So the people who are most likely to succeed on the basis, you know, on the, as predicted by their genotype, in our post-intervention world, that rank ordering is the same as it was before our intervention world. Um, I think these are considered less appealing to people as, as possibilities. Um, and I think Part of our hesitancy to even test things um, have to do with perhaps our fear that some of these will be will be shown to be the case. Um, so it's really really striking to me that you know 40 to 50 years after Jinx and Goldberger surfaced these critiques of is genetics relevant for social policy, our evidence base for which of these worlds do we live in is very very thin. Right. Do educational interventions sever genotype phenotype associations or exacerbate them? Um, are the social processes that are connecting genotypes for ph to phenotypes give us give us obvious targets for interventions, things we really do want to change, or are they reflecting social processes that, as a society, we justify as merit meritocratic? We don't have political will to change. Um, yeah. Can you add something to that? I mean, yeah. the, the idea that. If it's true that we have a mafia effect, so yeah. these interventions actually exacerbate the initial differences that we, we have. 
that would be a problem only if we, if we have a one dimensional ranking and like yeah. the only thing that we care about is being getting high grades in school and that's the only ranking that matters yeah. but if we believe in <clears throat> comparative advantage and uh, specialization of labor yeah. then it could be that every child has its own uh, uh, comparative advantage that might be rooted in genes and all of these interventions are making each one of us becoming better at what they can be better at and so this is like it's kind of like trying to uh, kill two birds with one stone but basically say the this intervention are going to be helping each one of us becoming way better at what they are uh, endowed to be better with and it's not necessarily going to be everyone can be better off by that there's not going to be an increase in inequality necessarily but, but that would only work if our education system would be different because what is, <laughs> what, is, what is valued in our education system is kind of high grade. So in the education system, it's true, but in the labor market, not necessarily. There's a a lot of different ways in which I can make a ton of money. I can be an athlete or I can be a teacher, right? And those two things uh, like rest on two very different types of genes. And if the intervention can make me just better at using those different skills to achieve labor market success, then we could be better off. So, so another thing related to that is also the, even let's say that that what you're, you're saying does help and there is just one dimension and there's an after effect. So the, okay. the people who are <coughs> who are already succeeding would that be even more interventions. There's still policy um, uh, implication that's positive for struggling kids and we actually already do it to some extent with kids with learning disabilities. Kids with learning disabilities take longer to train up to a, to a minimum standard. Uh, if we were to provide that level of support for kids without learning disabilities, we would probably take off even further relative to the kids with learning disabilities, but that's not what we typically do in society. What we do is we invest in children who are below a minimum standard even if it takes more, and even if other kids would benefit uh, disproportionately to them, but we invest our resources in the harvest of kids, and it brings them back up to the standards. So it actually, in effect, because the treatment isn't administered uniformly across the population, but it's administered to at-risk kids, it's still, in spite of the fact that in a randomized study you get a math effect, it can result in a shrinkage of performance gaps. So targeting interventions even if, if, if uh, towards kids that are going to benefit less from them, but if they're more intensive, mm -hmm. and still actually uh, be quite useful from a policy perspective for, for reducing gaps and inequalities. So I, one thing that I feel like is really useful from that is separating out the uniform, the uniformity of treatment administration from the uniformity of treatment effects and the extent to which those the extent to which you would need to strategically use one in response to information about the other if you wanted to, to achieve a particular outcome with regards to increasing the performance of some people but not other people. So another thing I got out of this discussion is you know the importance of how to measure the outcome and how to kind of like you know measure the effect of an intervention. So like I mean here point seems to suggest that you, know, you don't want to use like this scores to actually measure the outcome. Maybe you might be suggesting like the you know like the labor market performance for example that's that could be like one way or somewhere they go these performance metrics. But um, um yeah I mean yeah so um I guess you know um, the heterogeneous effects I think suggest also there's not in terms of you know uh, the dimensions you know which the intervention Yeah, I mean, I I think I'm having a, a similar sort of response to Margarita, which is there's um, like this idea in which every person has a set of skills that could be capitalized on so, so that they can be maximally successful in the labor market. Um, like that vision of society seems at odds with with an educational system that that is like 
interested in academic skills and also like an ed policy climate that's like focused on those, on on who which kids are, kids are better at other things. Yeah. Sure. I'm glad you're waiting. Where here. in this picture um, you place uh, the effects of discrimination? Yeah, I mean, I think, so this is, I mean, I think, fairly major. yeah, I mean, I think going back to, okay. yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think discri like, <laughs> discrimination, again, I think is this, like, it, discrimination as a social process that we think is unfair, it's a social response to the child that we can agree in, in abstract terms is, well, discrimination yeah. is uh, probably best observed in the labor market, though. So you're, the, the assumption that the labor market is somehow uh, neutral, uh, it was I, that's what I heard. Uh, and I'm not sure that the... Yeah. No, right. Well, there's, there's kind of two assumptions. One assumption is that the labor market is neutral. The other is that the labor market is static. <clears throat> the labor market is dynamic in part by people who have control of resources and get to shape. Um, right. The way it works, and so it, it's not just that it exists and then we fit people into it. Right. Um, just speaking, I'm not yeah. proposing labor market outcome to be the measure we should be using. I mean, and this, you know, <laughs> an example of you know how you know maybe the test score could be like a you know bad way of measuring the outcome. You know, the labor market of course could be another bad example, but you know, I'm just pointing it's, out that it's insufficient. It's certainly, me measuring measuring test scores is something we've noticed from studying the effects of these early interventions is that even when you, you don't permanently reorder people on test scores, you can see effects on labor market outcomes many years later, suggesting that a lot of the function of, the, of education to reducing inequality doesn't operate through those pathways. Right. Also, the labor market point, I think, doesn't quite hold up. Because you could be in the 55th percentile of grades and do very well in the labor market, but if you're in the 95th percentile of athletic ability or musical ability, you probably make about twenty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. that kind of right. So that's it's true that there's a lot more like uh, winner take all type of uh, effects, especially in athletics or musical ability. That, that's yeah, that's true. But I, I want to say the point of this hour is to raise, not resolve, these things, and so I think this is perfect because we have. The, the point about Matthew effects may not appear only on one Y, that we have to think about the matrix of, or the vector of Ys. Yeah. Yeah. And that when we think about heterogeneous effects, there's not just heterogeneity with respect to one Y, there's heterog heterogeneity with respect to heterogeneous outcomes. And I think that adds complexity, but has to be kept in mind. Yeah. And that's a theme we should return to as, as our groups present. Yeah. But I mean, we've already exploded this, or, this original yeah. I mean, what I was thinking of is uniform treatment effects versus heterogeneous treatment effects into three separable components, which is the multivariateness of the outcome, right? So it might be uniform or heterogeneous for different things. The uniformity versus heterogeneity of, of who you're administering it to. And then within each of those outcomes, how much does the effect of it vary across people? So, you know, we're, we're already exploding these, these uniformity, heterogeneity concepts. Yeah, so they're... Um, Thinking a little bit more futures thing, I didn't hesitate to say this because of Drew being very skeptical about fade out. But you know, uh, Paige and I, we had, I think it was in 2012, we had a paper where we looked at whether, and this was naturally occurring variation, whether kids were in preschool or in preschool during age at age four versus in some non traditional some some not center based care at age four. And what we found in that paper is that um, putting kids in preschool at age four, uh, exacerbated the genetic risks for aggressive problem behavior. But in another paper in the same data set, we found that um, uh, putting kids in preschool at age four, same intervention, although it was randomized, um, uh, diminished uh, test score gaps between rich and poor, uh, uh, white and, and, uh, and non-white. And so whether those carry forward is completely open question, right? But, but that was one example, and we didn't even compare it in the same papers, just two separate papers where we found, yeah. well, it's like, you know, what's your take on this? Did you put your kid in preschool? Well, do you want their genetic risk to be exacerbated for aggression, or do you want to reduce, you know, the, their, their uh, social disadvantage in, in, their, in their reading and math, uh, <coughs> literacy and, and, uh, and numeracy skills? And so 
Yeah. So the the, hand, the same intervention might like might narrow or widen the exact same one. What we think of as genetic risk, but genetic risk for different outcomes. Yeah, and, and I, I want to push us forward. Yeah. But I think a uh, uh, a I won't say elephant in the room because I use that metaphor differently earlier today. <laughs> but a an idea to contend with is is how we're conceptualizing of the social environment and the access to resources. Is it static or not? And that's why we thought having sociologists inform this is really kind of key. And so we'll, we'll kind of get to that. So we'll put that on hold, but I want to raise that um, we have to keep in mind our assumptions about whether and how resources and, and opportunities are allocated to, and to whom. Yeah. Can I ask a super naive question since David yes. said that was okay? Yeah. What's a Matthew with that? Rich get richer. Ah. It's from the Bible. Yeah. Ah. It's like that's a book, a spiritual text. Is that okay. New Testament? Because I yes, that's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the book well, for Gentiles. It's a book for Gentiles. Um, so, at yeah. one point, regarding the efficiency, I I like very much this idea. And so let's say that there's no multidimensionality. There's only one dimension. We do have Matthew effects, but and this makes people more productive, they will create, let me be very economic C here, and they create more GDP, and then we could just redistribute more. So we could say, okay, we do this intervention that exacerbates inequality in uh, pre-tax outcomes, so to speak. And then we just say, we just tax the hell out of the, of the 10%, the top 10%. Because we provide them with the tools to achieve those things. And as a society, we're all better off even if there's a lot of inequality pre-tax, yeah. we produce more, and then we just redistribute afterwards. Yeah. It could be what a social planner would do, or maybe even like a parent could do. Like a parent has three kids, and they see that the middle kid is kind of stupid, and they say, well, you know, I'm just going to invest a lot in the first and the third. They're going to make a ton of money, and I force them to <laughs> bail the second yeah. kid out. <laughs> so I want to I wanna compare, uh, and then we can, we can push forward to you know, David talking about interventions, but I, I like I want to compare that comment to Elliot's comment about um, well, if we knew this was going to yeah. exacerbate inequality, then we would just target it towards low, you know, kids who are most at risk or lowest performing in order to increase equity. And and whereas you're saying, well, what we would want to do is give it to the people who's going to profit it, from it more, so we can increase efficiency. Yeah. And and I just want to reflect that. We, are, we have really rapidly gotten into like core value debates, right? In which people like, what is more, like what is a better thing to do? What is more fair for a society to do? To like increase the performance of our most, um, most potentially productive members and then redistribute or like guarantee equity even if the pie is small, right? Like that, we've gotten there We've been talking for 20 minutes before we've gotten there. Yeah. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit because I'm not actually sure that the assumption that if you um, give some kids sort of a yeah. lower level treatment, yeah. or uh, I'm going to put it in tracking terms. Yeah. You know, the, the part of the tracking debate was around well, if we track perfectly, then yes, there will be high achieving tracks where they feed off each other and they do super well. So in that yeah. sense, inequality is increased. But in the perfect world, the treatment, the tracking, the, the lessons that people would learn from lower tracks would be better targeted to their needs mm -hmm. and strengths and they would actually grow at an optimal rate too. That was the argument. Yeah. So, um, you know, there was a lot of debate around it, and Jenks was against it, but um, let's not assume that a low-level treatment is necessarily worse for some people. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I think we've, we've really rapidly gotten into in addition to value things, hypotheticals, right? Like we're looking, we're looking for examples of interventions. What's well, called ideal types, right? And 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 I think that that speaks to the paucity of empirical data with which we can constrain this, our intuitions about what would happen under different circumstances. Yeah, and I think it, I think it's it, this is helpful because I think we need to be careful to separate 
what the data would say, so what the treatment effect is and yeah. the formula would work, and then how we would use that evidence to make recommendations for policy. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what Paige, you've convinced me of is that very often people have said, um, well, people could use this knowledge in a bad way, therefore we shouldn't have the knowledge. And so I, I, and so I think it's important to be able to separate the two so we can think about what science needs to be done and also how, how can it be useful for one set of values or, or a different set of values. And I think we can fully admit that we have been incredibly imperfect in our delivery of educational <laughs> right? And that our theories do not often manifest in the way that we deliver, and sometimes we're wrong, and sometimes we just do it really badly. But to the, the same extent, there is a great deal of imperfection in our understanding of the genetic Oh, no, that's when, yeah, all of these are And I think that we, until, and just think about all the things we know now that we thought differently even 10 years ago, and and I think that, that there's a level of discomfort on the genetic side of that when it's often taken as more perfect Definitive. knowledge yeah. than you know, the way that we deliver education. Yeah. Education, so. yeah, I mean, I think that that... So I think that's yeah. what David was saying. You know, what do we need to know to advance it's, that yeah. so that we do have a really good handle? Because we are playing with very sensitive subjects. And, yeah. Can I just interject very quickly? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm noticing the way that we're, the way we're sort of framing this discussion is why aren't people who are doing interventions taking into account genetic effects? Yeah. But I actually think the, the other sort of flip side here is why are people who are interested in genetic effects not yeah. thinking about interventions? Yeah. Um, so I think that, that there's a whole nother, you know, and there's different reasons, right? I think there are, you're trained in specific ways. I think you have specific kinds of knowledge. People who do genetic effects tend to be epidemic epidemiologists or epidemiology-like individuals who can just conceive of the world in different ways. So I think there's like these just like, you've got like basically sort of compartments of knowledge um, and, and sort of history and tradition and it's like the science of science, you know? I mean, I so Rob and um, David and I were in a meeting earlier this semester about planning UT is investing in this new child cohort study here in Austin called Whole Communities Whole Health. And we were in this meeting talking about things to measure. And at one point, um, one of the people running the meeting said, well, what would be on your wish list? Like, what would you add to this? And David said, well, I would want to add at least one intervention component to this cohort. And I remember thinking that literally would have never occurred to me because I'm in this you know, correlational or observational data mindset. Yep. And and I think you're totally right, that it's not just how can interventionists take the knowledge of, of genetics, but how can we think about how to use this and the sorts of data that we design yep. and, and study. So. so I think that one, and, and I don't have an answer here, but one worry, right, as someone who co-directs <laughs> an observational study, is if you intervene in your cohort, you're no longer able to make inferences about the general population. You can only make inferences about, about what's going on for them in naturally occurring situations. You can only make inferences about them, the context in which they've been intervening. Right? Well, so, all those minds that people have very strong opinions about what you just said. No, I'm curious. <laughs> we need to bring them in here. To I'd be curious to hear yeah. because, yeah. because you know, what if I wanted to write a paper about, you know, uh, I don't know, cor a correlative school performance, mm -hmm. and my my my. <laughs> participants in my cohort had been uh, had, had done a mindset intervention. A, a, a critic might say, "Well, that's not a correlative school performance it, it, uh, that, that I can generalize to all the kids who haven't had a mindset intervention. It's only a correlative school performance to kids who have had that intervention." Yeah, but you don't. Well, we don't. We can talk. Well, no, I'm curious. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. I, I, I just want just to know just what the move. solution yeah. is. Yeah. I want to put it in. Is that is something that we should definitely That's talk right. about more? Yeah, just yeah. So you're living examples. Yes. Yeah. So, play devil's advocate, just a play devil's advocate. So, when we are look, interested in the heritability of anxiety, like if someone were and they were doing a twin study, yeah. they don't, um, they just say, What's the heritability of anxiety in my sample at this time? I, I don't know of a single study that has pulled out people who've received treatment versus people who haven't. Like, we yeah, don't. But it's, this is, that's the same thing as, as, as the control group in any randomized control trial is still receiving treatment, they're just reserving treatment as usual. So right, if I want to make inferences about the general population that in concert, that has people who are receiving treatment as usual, I don't want to give them an extra treatment. 
I would be interested in knowing what's the heritability of anxiety before any treatment at all, and what's the heritability of anxiety after treatment. And we don't know. We don't do that. I well, mean, a behavior geneticist, we could collect those data, but we don't. But we don't, we don't even drug, consider. Like, say, yeah. You don't say, okay, now everyone in my control group can't take any of the pre existing anxiety drugs or take any pre existing anxiety therapies. You're always comparing your to, to whatever the, 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 the the community standard is for, for care. Yeah, no, so, I know. I'm just saying that our heritability estimates are, um, we think of that they're naturally occurring in the sense that we are, in fact, representing what the heritability of anxiety is in our sample at this given moment, regardless of pride, for sure. Well, I'm not even saying heritability per se, but any correlate or any. any so I'll, I'll yeah. jump in for a second. So I think. You know, we were talking about a long, a, a big issue, which is, am I going to spoil my sample, right? And this yeah, is, yeah. You know, do I spoil the sample and do funder? Am I now ineligible for this whole track of funding? And you know, maybe I can run into oh, the best of us. I, I was yes. yeah. oh, no, but I mean, whatever. But it's going to be a big issue where that's for the scientific yeah. power right. for a lot of these yeah. things. Yeah. Right. And and you have to be strategic and think. And, and a lot of some courts are kind of waiting, like, where is the intervention that's going to come that I'm going to be willing to... Right, so what, what I want to suggest is that that is an important issue to raise, to keep in mind over the course of the, the, next, the yeah. meeting. And the uh, short answer is, if if there are two ways to pitch a study, then maybe it's, there's a way to pitch for double the sample size. <laughs> right? So, yeah. So let's, um, let's move on so we can talk about some... Intervention stuff. Um, yes. So why are we having this meeting now? I mean, obviously, Jensen was 50 years ago. James and Goldberger were 40 years ago. What has changed? And one thing that's obviously changed has been um, the availability of tools other than <coughs> family design in order to get at genetically associated individual differences. And, and you know, it's great that Patrick is here and because obviously they worked very hard on this. Um, effort to be able to identify genetic variants that can be used to predict real-world outcomes, such as graduating from college and other things. Um, so that's obviously one change that I think has brought this, this idea of can we integrate genetics and, and intervention study in terms of like a new tool that might make it more pragmatic or more feasible. Um, but I don't... I don't think that's the only reason why this particular time is, is ripe to be thinking about these issues. Um, yeah, and um, so uh, from my perspective, what are some new advances? So um, in the last, I don't know, uh, five years, there's been an explosion of interest in uh, light touch interventions that can be done in very large samples and have been tested in um, industry and government and so on, perhaps best characterized by um, Maya Shankar working with Tom Khalil to start the social behavioral sciences team under the Obama administration, which then led to kind of splinter organizations in a number of state and local governments where um, people randomized things like making it easier to fill out your financial paperwork to get loans and so on. Um, the effects are uh, modest, but with, some, with uh, R&D and tinkering can show up in a number of different settings. Because they can be done at massive scale, you can easily imagine having other types of information, either about their neighborhoods or about their um, uh, genotypes, um, to think about large sample tests of heterogeneity when we imagine that the moderators are kind of weak effects and noisy. Um, we can maybe get um, large studies with lots of power. Uh, second is, it's really an explosion of rich national data sets that have exposed us to information about uh, really the magnitudes of inequalities. So one prominent example is Sean Reardon's uh, analysis of test score data across 50 states. So with some um, recent statistical advances, they've been able to equate the uh, state test scores across states and then look at the distribution of um, students' performance in K-8 to as a function of family socioeconomic status or family income. And what you see is a strikingly high correlation at the school district level between family income and test scores, um, something that <coughs> also shakes out by race and ethnicity. Um, and I think if, if those two worlds are the worlds that I usually live in, it, uh, world one is wa a world of endless possibility to induce change, to introduce exogenous shocks and improve people's lives. So an optimism about malleability of people's life circumstances. And then, the, and then also being confronted with 
the kind of massive um, uh, uh, segregation with which uh, young people attend uh, advantaged schools or not, or live in advantaged communities or not, and so on. So uh, it, what seems in contrast is um, a strong belief in malleability and then also a strong uh, perception of environmental determinism. Um, and so <clears throat> combining that with increasingly large predictive validity of um, polygenic scores, it looks like there's three conflicting narratives. Strong genetic determinism, strong environmental or neighborhood determinism, and strong potential to um, change people's lives through even tiny light touch interventions. And those three seem at odds, and it seems in intriguing to think about pulling them together. And what my hypothesis is for this meeting is that um, the recent dissatisfactions with um, mediation analysis and with the hunt for post hoc subgroup effects, which has led to, I think, some exciting new ideas around treatment effect heterogeneity, is a way to combine um, the research on genetics, the research on light touch interventions, and the research on neighborhoods. And so I feel like um, a productive way to bridge these three areas would have to build on um, a rigorous framework for thinking about effect mechanism and effect um, heterogeneity. Um, so uh, and I feel like the field is just at the point where there are increasingly large calls for understanding mechanism and understanding uh, heterogeneity in ways that go beyond traditional correlational med mediation analysis. Um, so I, I wanted to share like a very simplified model of intervention effect that's in my mind. Um, when I think about a way to combine these areas of research, uh, I'll use the example of the National Study of Learning Mindsets that Rob and Chandra and I are uh, co eyes for. This will be very simplified. I'm happy to go into greater detail if you'd like. Um, but the growth mindset is an idea growing out of laboratory research uh, suggests that when uh, young people have uh, the idea that their intellectual ability is fixed and can't be changed, they're more likely to attribute struggles and difficulties in school to uh, something that can't be um, remediated and then uh, suffer loss of motivation in the face of challenges. And so a supposed um, treatment or solution to that idea is to convey the potential under some conditions for intellectual ability to be developed under the right conditions with the right support. And uh, in some early trials, there uh, were promising modest results looking at uh, immediate motivation and then subsequently grades in school when conveying this message to young people in high school. Let's take an, like, an idealized, simplified version of, of um, what the treatment looks like, right? You are, or what the process supposedly looks like. We as researchers, all we control is the random assignment. We control whether the computer gives you 50 minutes of growth mindset or 50 minutes of placebo information. Um, presumably, large proportions of young people actually complete those materials. Um, hopefully, we've designed good procedures to do that. Hopefully, it uh, changes your beliefs in some way. That is over the course of 50 minutes. Uh, then we wait nine months, and some miracle happens, and then <laughs> grades are higher when we come to pull your grades from uh, administrative records. right? And um, uh, what, uh, what, what our field has assumed is that uh, it's not the case that people have this uh, dramatic change in their beliefs and they walk around and they see everything in the world differently, but rather that they begin to perceive the world differently and then initially take some steps in line with that new perception and that those in turn reinforce uh, the idea they've been taught. So uh, Jeff uh, Cohen has called this a recursive process model. So a young person who thinks that intelligence is at least somewhat malleable in response to effort might try harder on their challenging work. Um, then a teacher might notice that greater effort, encourage it, say, um, uh, this uh, is really positive. They might form a stronger relationship with that young person. That may, in turn, um, cause a young person to try even harder again on the next task. Then, when they're doing well, they might uh, get some kind of social reward from their peers, feel encouraged. Um, behave more in line with the positive social norm of uh, doing well, getting ahead in school. Right? So that's uh, a hypothesized set of uh, mediators. Um, what uh, you will immediately notice is the, the, the only exogenous part is the offer of the treatment. And kind of all the mediators depend on something that happens in the environment. You have to, after trying hard, 
you have to have a teacher who would ever notice that you're trying hard. If the teacher is going to be blind to your behaviors, then you can imagine we change your beliefs, but there's nothing to sustain the treatment. Um, it also assumes that there's a social dynamic in which your motivation elicits some kind of social reward. Um, and if it doesn't, if that setting uh, doesn't offer that, then again, you might imagine we change your beliefs, but we shouldn't see, see the outcome of change. So um, we have long in our, in our field assumed that this is what's happening because it seems the only way to explain how uh, something that lasts under an hour could have effects months or, or years later. Um, but it's been really hard to test this. And so the, what drew me into thinking about treatment effect heterogeneity is to say, well, what if we uh, had a random sample of the population and we looked, we delivered this treatment and we homogeneously caused adoption of a mindset, but then sampled places where maybe the teachers wouldn't notice uh, your um, effort and maybe where the peer norm wasn't supportive, right? And so what we've done is um, uh, the National Study of Learning Mindsets was designed that way. It's a random sample of public high schools, and we have schools where um, there is uh, there are very few resources, as low achieving schools, and schools that are very high achieving have many educational resources. There are also schools where there's a strong peer norm for working hard, and other places where there's not a strong peer norm for working hard. And we find that those school level factors help explain a portion of the variability across schools in the effectiveness of the treatment on, for instance, math and science teaching at the end of the year, or even enrollment in, in advanced courses the next year in 10th grade. Um, but where you might, so, so where we've taken this is the sociology to intervention angle. What seems exciting is to, to bring in genetic information. So let's take the supposed unmeasured mediator of peers encouraging one's effort. Well, if that is a socially rewarding experience, you might imagine that process would be more self-reinforcing among people who are more inclined to social reward, who are focusing more on um, how um, you know, good it feels to be a buyer, to be respected, to get status from others. So just throwing this out there, um, you know, it, is it possible that um, polygenic scores that relate to reward sensitivity or that have been related to um, deviant behavior, maybe through peer conformity processes, could actually show positive association with academic outcomes if it was if we were able to um, uh, induce a, a psychological change that caused young people to feel positive social reward from um, uh, positive academic behaviors, from trying harder in school, and so on. And so, um, one one intriguing new idea that that um, hasn't really fully been tested, but um, is, is something that we can um, reject or, or build on or um, revise in this meeting, is whether one way to understand the mechanisms for uh, seemingly long lag effects of brief interventions is to first study the context in which the resources are available to sustain them, but also look at individual differences in um, uh, genotypes and phenotypes that are related to the supposed mechanisms and the supposed uh, mediators. Okay. I yeah. have a stupid question. What's yeah. the difference between moderator and mediator? That's a great question. Uh, so the, um, the part of it is historical okay. in, in how people do it. So uh, in the, the, the <clears throat> simplified psychology version is offering a treatment, then measuring like the number of minutes kids might spend on challenging work and showing a treatment effect on that, and then estimating the correlation of minutes spent on challenging work with your grades, and then um, multiplying those two correlations to get an indirect effect through from a treatment to the supposed mediator to the supposed outcome. A uh, moderator is an interaction effect. It would be um, comparing the treatment effect in contexts where this variable is high versus this variable is low. But one reason why I'm excited that, that Tepi's here is he has been leading a, a new framework to integrate those two ideas okay. under the broader umbrella of understanding mechanism. And I think you'll present that later this afternoon in the heterogeneity setting. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to add anything to what I just said? No, I mean, to the more like a e conversion, I would say, is like the mediator is most typically variable that's affected by the treatment. And then the moderator is a typically a good treatment variable that interacts with the treatment. But, you could do but they could have the same conceptual goal of understanding mechanism. Right. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So thinking about you know having um, heard David present a little bit about the mindset intervention work that he's working on, and thinking about how he's conceptualized how how genetic measurement can um, fit into this. It seems that there's new opportunities here for, I'm saying, behavioral genetics or understanding genetic influences on behavior. Um, and I, we, I'm going to go through these somewhat quickly, but I, the questions that we've been talking about, of like whether existing interventions mitigate genetically associated inequalities or outcome or exacerbate them. Um, can we prospectively identify which people are likely responders or non-responders to an existing intervention? Um, David was talking about how using genes as a tool for understanding, like some, and then some magic happens, like what are the mechanisms here? Um, I tend to think about it almost in the opposite way, which is that we, we know that people are born with certain genotypes and then some magic happens and then they graduate from college, right? I mean, they, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a 30 year developmental process or 25 year developmental process and those intermediating mechanisms are, we have lots of theories about what happens in between those. Um, but in terms of can we, can we use interventions to push on a hypothesized mediating mechanism and in so doing more rigorously test that as a hypothesis of how genotypes are connected to phenotypes um, is something that I'm I'm really interested in. Um, but I think I, I going back to I don't think this is just a I don't think this is just about like what can genetics give intervention science or what intervention science can give genetics. I really do think that there's new opportunities for both fields to perhaps have theoretical advancements based on this um, this intersection. Yeah, and so for, so for me, it, it, apart from the broader inter interdisciplinary goals of understanding human development, I think selfishly about interventions, I think s learning how to think sociologically about contexts and, and, uh, and allocation of resources that allow people to be in certain gateways or not um, will help me understand the mechanisms, the long lag mechanisms, or the, the mechanisms that explain long lag effects of interventions. Uh, but also, the, the, I'm curious to find out if the genetic information can do the same. And I think that's a, that's a tractable research question, given how now cost-effective it is to genotype people and how uh, uh, relatively <coughs> we can test interventions in large samples of tens of thousands uh, of people. Um, and then a goal is to build better theories of the science of human behavior change, which I think is one of the kind of key defining issues um, in our society, given the explosion of choice that individuals have, I think, finding ways to induce positive internalized behavior change um, that is in some ways uh, um, uh, goes beyond the nudge approach, which, which controls um, the choices people have and instead thinks about um, how people um, over time engage in, in, in kind of on purpose uh, choose uh, behaviors that are either good for them or society. How do we understand how to do that uh, better? I think that's a, a key question. Um, and then interventions, in psychology at least, have for a long time been content to say, here's our lab study, here's our initial intervention, our theory is true, and then kind of left it from there, left it at there. And I think it's increasingly dissatisfying to think of interventions as proofs of concept. And increasingly we're thinking about, well, what would it look like to actually induce positive uh, change um, in a population? Right, to go from like the lab studies of fluoride to actually fluoride. I don't know if that's a palatable example or not. But, um, uh, and so I think, um, and then the last point gets to Ellie's point, which is um, the, I, th I think getting large randomized trials funded requires a bit of savvy to have multiple reasons why people would want to support them. And sometimes funders are interested in the treatment, sometimes funders are interested in a longitudinal data set, and sometimes they're interested maybe in a, in a genetic effect or so on. And so I think there are ways, the way we pitch the National Study of Learning Mindsets is first as a randomized trial and now as a longitudinal data set, one of the latest cohorts with a high response rate and so on to track young people in America. And so I think there are ways to think of getting funding to double the sample sizes for, for twin studies because it involves an intervention. And I know Sibel Raber has done that for her 
CSRP, the way she funded the long-term follow-up for the Chicago Readiness was to pitch a ninth, <coughs> ninth grade mindset intervention. And then the data collection involved with that. So um, that's something to discuss. And then Rob, uh, we asked you to fill us in on the opportunities from the sociology and that quality. Sorry, can oh, yeah. I ask you a very naive question yes. before moving there? So how easy and scalable was it to measure genotypes? And how, how, what's the technology for measuring genotypes? And then, actually, what are the genotypes besides the <laughs> Oh, so you put so it in the mail, the mail. Uh, and uh, for you know fifty to sixty dollars, you get back uh, a couple of hundred thousand data points that that you can scale to a couple of million data points. Okay, um, you can descale. <laughs> right, right. And so and then, and then so that that gives you a huge amount of flexibility in terms of what you can measure. Uh, um, the question is, you know, the question is, what are the measurements you can derive from these genomes that are relevant to intervention researchers, uh, and then specifically intervention researchers interested in improving school outcomes for kids or, or social outcomes right. for, for adults? I think that's a much tougher question to answer. That's sort of like the subject of a long interactive conversation. Um, but but I think it's feasible. It's scalable. It's very inexpensive compared to other things that we do to get data out of people. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. And there's, well, I guess the only thing that's <coughs> is that um, there are very large genetic meta-analyses that can be used mm -hmm. to um, basically score these millions of markers so that you're not having to deal with overfitting in your own data. But and it's just it's, cheaper. it's, it's uh, much cheaper and easier than collecting the high school transcripts for the national study and having them coded. So, the, the, regarding the cheap thing, so it's true that it doesn't cost a lot of money to genotype people now, but there's, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people who just say, no matter what happens, we're not gonna ask public school children to, we're not gonna collect genotype on public school children, like, I'm not, like directors and uh, educators and so on and so forth, they just say no genes cannot enter in the school. Full stop. Exactly so right. the cost there is just infinite. It might be forty bucks once you have the the saliva, but it's infinite because you can never get the saliva. So that's true. That's true. If, that was true if you need school, I mean, yeah. if you need the schools to buy in right. to it, which we don't always need. I mean, if you collect a sample, you know, even if you go through schools, what matters is whether the families will consent to it, which is a lower bar yeah. in many ways because it's somewhat devoid of more of the political. The reason that we that schools don't do it is because, you know, we have a horrific and horrible track record yeah. on this. Um, but you know, I mean, we I've been a part of a national study with um, where you know we just didn't ask the schools, we just and ask the parents, and they all said yes. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like a preliminary step is a comparison. They actually, they did it. And at, and at health, you know, they did it too. And they, I mean, the, the, it's because they, they went, I mean, this is, that's a they practical issue. They, yeah. they did it afterwards. They did it at 18, yeah. 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 I mean, generally, it's funny how these families are much more likely to give that than they are to give their addresses or right. their. <laughs> so, <laughs> so fragile families collected it when the kids were nine. We got it from the moms and the kids, about 85% mm -hmm. said we're willing to do that. And then we, when we asked them when they were 15, uh, you know, it, another 5% that said no the first time, or 10% who said no the first time said yes the second time. But for the so, national study, if we, I mean, because that is a school-based study, if we had, and it yeah. was so hard to get them to sign on, I mean, I think that is one of the reasons why we didn't pursue the... Yeah, yeah the I mean, but, and, and, uh, and... Because we knew yeah. it would be an eye. Already, it's already yeah, well, we now didn't go to parents, but then and now we could go. Yeah. Well, right, but 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 um, we could probably never get a, a funding agency to fund a straight up replication of the national mindset study. But you could imagine someone funding something that adds enough a genetic element or deeper neighborhoods or so on. So, um, but 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 I think I, th I think a precursor to making strong arguments to include the data is having clarity about what how it's useful. For science, yeah. or how yeah. it can be beneficial, and, and so I think this meeting is needed in, in a way to 
to find out if there is a compelling rationale. What's nice about genetic eating too is that, you know, so that we're, we're talking to a study that John List did several years ago, and so they have the data from the intervention, um, but they still have contact with all of the subjects, mm -hmm. and so we're talking to them about collecting genes from <coughs> them, and you can, like, the, 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 their genes haven't changed uh, since, since the intervention happened, and so you can do everything afterwards. Yeah. Drew, and then we're gonna hear from Rob. Yeah, uh, so the, the, something that, uh, seems to come up over and over when, when the, uh, I don't know, psych psychometrically trained people, including behavior geneticists, start to talk to interventionists, uh, is this, this, I think you articulated well, this clash between the optimistic view where the null hypothesis is wrong, and then the, the pessimistic view where there, there are just these big, persistent, whatever, achievement gaps and individual differences, whatever you're doing. And, uh, and, and, and I, I think that the, for, for uh, us to interact uh, productively today, kind of a, a distinction that maybe should be in the back of our minds is the, the distinction between forward causal inference, where we're, we're studying the, the unknown causes of known effects, right? What would happen if I changed this one thing? And, and backward causal inference, which historically is what the geneticists have, have done, which is what, let's partition the, the, this known set, this known variance into into different categories, and uh, uh, I, th that, that, I think I think one reason to be excited about about new genetic research and, and possible synergy with with uh, uh, intervention research is the the PGN the, 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 the having these polygenic risk scores. We're we're thinking about genes in a little bit more similar way to the classic. You know, what would cause the difference, people? What would happen if I changed this locus or something like that? But uh, you know, both I guess both both areas uh, share this similar problem. I think, especially in, in new genetic research, of not fully understanding the mechanisms uh, uh, involved, and, and maybe we can help each other figure out the mechanisms. But anyway, that this I think that this this uh, this uh, distinction. At least it was for me when I started hanging out with the policy people. Everyone's a determinist when they're looking through the rear view mirror, right? The road behind you. Is all those causal pathways are clear. Great. Rob? Yeah, you know, I have a, one of my best friends is a very cranky behavioral geneticist, and maybe the crankiest. <laughs> and um, he just did the 23andMe thing. Um, found a brother. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, found a brother on it, and so he's now rethinking his the fascination with genetics. Didn't really want to know he had a brother out there that he'd never met, met before. But um, anyway, it's going to be a difficult family. Yeah, yeah. Like the push in advertising. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They need to. There was one in Austin this week too, where a guy. Did you read that in the States? Mm -hmm. Then about <coughs> his grandfather and his parent. There was a guy out there who didn't know he had. You know, it's always yeah. man. <laughs> 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 one of the things you know that, that anecdote brings up is the, the pace at which what people understand about their genetics, mm -hmm. how accessible the genetics are, is, is changing. So we're thinking about like you're saying eighty five percent of the families that you talk to were happy to give over the DNA to children. People were more prepared to give you their DNA than they were to give you, you know, their their exactly. tax records, their social security mm -hmm. number. Um, that may accelerate. People may become increasingly comfortable with handing over their DNA, um, or things could change, I think, dramatically in the other direction. So in some sense, speculating about how the public will respond to efforts toward genetic yeah. data collection at, at this stage is, is hard. I kind of kept, I keep on, I'm always surprised. I expected the backlash to have already started, though, you know, and I think that there's been a discussion in this last year around that, um, that kind of was prompted by the Golden State Killer thing, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's, yes. you know, and that I, I can't remember what journal it did, but, you know, within 2020, every white American will be identifiable in these databases, even if they haven't participated yeah. and things like that. As that goes on, I imagine we're going to get less. And I think that people have become more attuned to, you know, tracking cookies on the internet. And they're still lagging behind on being attuned to what these data can be used yeah. to do. But 
I mean, it's I, coming. I, I, I just don't know it. what magnitude it's going to be. Yeah. It does require a, a level of, um, I don't want to say intellectualism, but a level of, you know, you really have to think through, and it's a complicated, it's a complicated subject, and you have to engage with it, and that's maybe why we haven't had this backlash yet, because mm -hmm. it does require a lot of cognitive. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think on the part of researchers who are thinking about asking people, large numbers of people, possibly minors, mm -hmm. for their DNA, um, you know, the, the bar ought to be raised on, on what we're doing to protect those data and the benefits we're going to endeavor to, to give our research participants from those data. So the, the old model of, you give us your data, we'll keep it nominally secure in the way we keep your other data secure, and we're not going to tell you anything about it, uh, might last for a little while officially. But I think if we don't act to do better sooner, uh, <coughs> we'll get regulated uh, in ways that, that are maybe not you know, in our interest. So, so the data security around human genetics is poor. Uh, the NIH is not mandating it to be better. There was a, a moment when it seemed like maybe they were going to be serious about it, but they're still comfortable treating it as the identified secondary data for most purposes. I mean, it's classified as sensitive, but you can keep it in lots of places where you ought not be, be able to keep people's DNA. And, and we're also not doing much to make it navigable for research participants, which we, I think, should be offering. Right? There are lots of services now that will curate genomes, and, and so if we're going to collect people's DNA, you know, we, we need to be able to offer them the opportunity to, to have it. Yeah, but in our experience, the trust issues are not with like hackers stealing your data, uh, but more like in the study Crystal presents, done 45 minutes from here, rural Texas, they were like, Obama's not getting my DNA. Right? It, was more, it was more that official sources like the government would securely have it, but then use it in various ways. So I think there's, that's just one example of how there's a lot of stories in people's minds that, that to do this kind of research, we'd have to resolve. But I'm determined to let Rob. Well, I, was just gonna say, I just want to follow up with this. I think that, this is a, that what you just said is especially true now that a lot of the people that are collecting these data are not coming from a genetics background. Right, they're having their population scientists, for example, who are in charge of these data collections and how they really. I mean, I don't know how to deal with it, right? But when you go through an NIH review process to collect population data, you better have a genetic component in there, or it's not going to get funded, right? So, you know, and then we don't know what we're doing. Colder came off of that. <laughs> um, I was just gonna. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, just go through this. But. I mean, I basically was just talking a little bit about the discomfort that a lot of people who study educational inequality have with, with genetics, and this idea, you know, that our reluctance to uh, attribute solely or primarily uh, academic performance to things that are, you know, inside of a person, and not just genetics, but also this is one of the criticisms of mindset too, um, as opposed to the environment. It just seems like it's. Uh, for a lot of people, there's the, it's like a hop, skip, and a jump to talking about inequality as emerging from within the person as opposed to being imposed upon the person. But I mean, it's clear as we learn more about genetic expressions and academic performance that like, those people are completely missing the boat. And I think there's a methodological way of thinking about that, which you alluded to too, which is just completely missing out on a very large set of unobservable compounds that are reducing your uh, causal inference. And I remember when Paige gave her job time, you know, was it two years ago or 20 years ago that you did that? I can never remember. I have no sense of time with people. I always think I've known them forever. Um, but you know, that's one of the ways that you pitched it that really spoke to the Population Research Center office. They're like, oh, well, we, we don't care about genetics, but we do care about causal inference. But I think that isn't the easy way to do it, and the harder way to do it is to make an argument about the theoretically understanding inequality and how there are huge gaps in our theories of the way inequality works, and therefore the way that we can environmentally uh, respond to those inequalities. And so I think that one way I try to talk about it when I'm in these audiences is thinking about the way understanding genetics opens up a window into where inequality is in the system or in the educational career. And so you can say, well, and these are these um, these examples seem somewhat contradictory, but 
one of them is that if you can show that there are some, there are some groups of children or students that systematically are underperforming their genetic potential, well, then that's a sign that there's a weak spot in your your system of educational opportunity, and we need to address that. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, somewhat conversely is, are there parts of the educational career, are there spots and settings in the school district where there's too much genetic expression, you know, where, ge where, where genetic expressions are especially acute. Again, that suggests that there's some weak spot in the way that you're delivering curriculum or instruction or opportunity to students and you need to, you know, what it's doing is lasering you in on where you need to pay attention. And the intervention might not be to change genetics. I don't know how you do that or genetic expression. It's, it's a way of, there are always things that we could do um, to improve performance, and we just need to know better where to deliver it and where to do that. And I think that you know the data are getting there, right? And the will is getting there, but we still, I'm not talking about the genetics people or the intervention people, I'm talking about the inequality people, we still haven't gotten there in terms of our theoretical understanding of what we're doing. And without that, you know, it's really hard to engage in these things. And I also think it's somewhat, telling that um, you know a lot of the people from the inequality world who have gotten into genetics um, aren't really like for example with the schooling stuff a lot of the research from sociology that has that genetic component on that those aren't necessarily people who study schools or education and so again they're stronger on the genetic side than they are on the educational side and unfortunately we don't have anybody going the opposite way Right, and so we, that's where we're stuck right now. So, you know, you had mentioned, you know, this idea, well, if you find a genetic influence, you can't change it, maybe there's something else you could do. I think perhaps... I didn't say we can't, I just was like, I didn't know well, how you do it. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess it's usually therapy. But yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that, that it's probably useful to think about an update to one of Jenks's uh, hypothetical examples in, in, in terms of a real empirical data, it's not super social, but in a way it is. Um, one of the robust correlates of getting lung cancer is a variant in the nicotine receptor gene. It is a variant that makes people basically enjoy smoking cigarettes. It's a, it's a genetic variant that increases risk for, can for lung cancer. It's operating entirely through a behavioral mechanism that's associated with environmental exposure, you don't need to change the nicotine receptor gene in order to intervene. You need to do something on the side of smoking. Tax cigarettes, do uh, treatment for smoking. That's gonna reduce lung cancer. It's completely intervenable. And it's also something that is, <coughs> it's not just it's not just oh we need to control away third variable compounds to get at the real genetics of cancer, it's actually, or, or the real influences on cancer. It is itself an influence of cancer that you don't want to control, you want to understand the mechanism. And it's so, an instrument. It's, it's yeah. exactly right, and it's an instrument. I mean, the example I always use with this is about the connection between obesity and education, you know? There's been a lot of effort, primarily from economists, to show that that association is completely genetically, you know, confounded. And I think that that's really important for understanding what the obesity is and the way it works. But I don't, I don't think that it changes the way we would respond to to that. The fact is that there are obese people that are struggling in the educational system, and we would respond to that the same way we respond to kids with learning disabilities. So I'm not sure what it means to genetically confounded, right? Because if obesity is heritable and obesity causes education, then um, there's going to be genetic link. And if education is heritable and education has an effect on obesity. I suppose confounded means that the genes just cause both and there's no causal exactly. effect between the well, exactly. yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that obesity itself that's is the not assumption. That's not education. Not but in that sense, that, oh, the, 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 you know, whether it's genetic or not, there's still, uh, obesity is, is, is in some ways a marker of something. And so by intervening with that group, statistically speaking, mm -hmm. we are going to have so the reason, I mean, I, I love when Kendler talks about this, like the nicotine as an oncogene. Um, I think one question is how to make that as an example stickier and more widely accessible to lots of disciplines so that, because I think it's a really good example that people can hang their intuitions on in terms of 
environmentally pushable genetic effects on something, but I think that is contrary to how many people think of genetics. So I'm gonna let Candace talk, and then we're gonna raise some general objections, and then I do wanna have you all have time to talk in, in smaller groups. I'm just gonna add on to Rob's comment. I think this is, and this is what I brought up earlier, I think the fundamental issue with the interventions, and you see some of the intervention studies that have done this will show that the intervention is most effective for people with a certain risk marker for genetic score, but you get the exact same answer if you took a behavioral measure and cut off that top of the distribution, mm -hmm. right? And so the markers are you now something that we can see that help us to explain treatment heterogeneity or who might benefit more. They're phenotypic, right? And whether or not that's genetically driven might matter in terms of response to treatment, but I think we have to be honest with saying where we are in the science of that mechanism right now, which I know you're going to be talking about, which has not passed a threshold that would justify or make it palatable to the, make it worth the fight, right? And, or maybe it has, and maybe that's the point of this meeting, to say what level does the science need to raise to, to make it worth the battle that would have to be waged to get genetics into the intervention context. Because right now, it, it, it seems like a tough argument to make that this would improve an intervention that would improve kids' lives that would, with, and with the unknown risks. So the science being the biological causal mechanisms of genetic variants on outcomes. Right. So is it, you know, is there something that's going to change the way that we do interventions that's based on the biological mechanism that would enhance the effect of the intervention? Because right now, you know, we do have evidence that people who are at higher polygenic risk score might benefit more. But we can get the same answer if we just split it on a phenotype. Right? Yeah, so if you select on a phenotype, you're selecting on, on, on uh, compounds rather than so basically, one thing that genetics applies is to the, the power of instrumental variables. Sure, and from a research perspective, and I, and I get it, and I get the science of it, and I get why we should go down this road and we should figure this out, and you know, I hope I live long enough when it comes to, you know, <laughs> so, so that there, we can see the benefit. But if you're looking at it from an intervention perspective or where I'm going to invest money from a policy perspective, the costs of integrating genetics, for the reason we've talked about now, are high, right? Um, and so what what is the threshold in terms of you know, added value to society, the person, you know. Yeah, if we're basing that on some compound, you know, a phenotype, it's a compound, right, yeah. as opposed to the real thing, how much, that means that there's some things we're going to get wrong, right? Yeah. But how much of that is that we're going to get wrong? Is, is there enough, are we going to get enough wrong on that side to justify? Well, I mean, the, the question is how much more right are you going to get yeah, with the right, genetics, which are, exactly. which are themselves, like, not that much less complicated to interpret than, than where you sit on the phenotypic distribution pre-treatment. I, I think, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm basically entirely at Candace's camp on this. Like, if the question is, should we be genotyping people to improve the efficacy of social and behavioral interventions designed to improve performance for kids in the population? No. You know, can we integrate genetics and intervention science to advance our understanding of mechanisms of human development uh, or to help us design better interventions that can be implemented without genetic information, you know, there I would make a case. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think, I mean, so maybe, maybe I should just ask, is there anyone here who is advocating the position that, that we should be today genotyping kids to, to sort of direct social policy yeah, resources? I'm gonna punt that well, tomorrow at noon, because that- Well, your question is like, should well, we be doing the cloning thing? Well, I, I just, I, I'm just saying, like, I don't think anybody's saying that. In this room, but but maybe I should clarify that, and then we can actually. I mean, I, I, should, the question is: Should we tailor treatments to people's genetic profiles today? Yeah, are we? Is that is that actually what we're uh, in, medicine, yes. in medicine? Yes, in medicine, of course. In cancer, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's 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 not be okay. Okay, so, so I actually think that this is like a really great. I mean, question to circle back to tomorrow, like after y'all have had a chance to actually talk to each other about your expertise. Like, I mean, I think that's a great, what is this, I mean, we have this vague idea that this would be useful, but what are the constraints around what, for what will it be useful pragmatically versus theoretically and on what time scale for which phenotypes? I don't think there's a, a one size fits all answer to that, but I also think that the answer to that might evolve a little bit beyond our initial intuitions, and that's kind of the point of what we're doing here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to take credit for being fabulous teachers, because we have gotten you all excited about the question that we're going to <laughs> over the next two days.
Um, yeah, Dick and has now, a fabulous t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, now we're going to talk about a couple landmines that are looming large, and then we want to go over some norms that we're already behaving in line with, which is great. And then we want to get into small groups so that yeah. way we can educate each other from the different yeah. our different fields. Um, so I just think this is important to talk about, which is from the beginning, the original Jensen formulation, um, whether it's explicit or implicit, any, any conversation about genetics and academic achievement in the U.S. is associated in people's minds with racial disparities. And, um, and, and inequalities in educational opportunities or outcomes are structured by race in the U.S. Um, the public conversation on this topic has always been entwined, even if geneticists are saying explicitly this, you know, we are only making inferences about differences within people of European ancestry. If you say genes, if you say IQ, most people think race, but that's just part of people's associative network. Um, and at the same time, you know, talking about the, where the science is, are, and, and how, what value add will genotypes give us about phenotypic information, um, for, for people who are not of European ancestry, that answer is almost nothing, right? I mean, we have very limited ability to measure polygenic risk outside of European ancestry populations. Um, and I think, you know, this is something that I'm interested in your Patrick's thoughts and other people's thought, and as, as m more GWAS information about non-European samples comes in, in our ability to construct valid, robust, reliable polygenic scores in non-European populations improves, how are we going to integrate genetic information in multi-ethnic samples in a way that does not blow up all of our conversations about scientific racism? I think that is a real problem that um, I don't know the answer to. Um, right now, we have kind of like a get-out-of-jail-free card in which we say, oh, we're only talking about differences within white people. I think even if we're saying we're only talking about differences within ancestral groups, but now we're measuring genotypes in um, minority populations in school children, that is, that is politically explosive for very good reasons, and I don't think we have a good solution to that right and now. And just on this point, what's, what's obvious is that we don't have a ton of diversity in the room, and uh, one obvious um, uh, way to, to continually re-examine our assumptions and, and think about how to use this information in ways that don't contribute to scientific racism is to have um, more individuals of color in leadership positions in this work. And in some ways, um, the difficulty of, um, uh, of including members of um, groups that are disadvantaged or faculty members of color in this conversation is in some ways evidence of what we're trying to study, which is, um, sorting even in the, the highest levels of academia on the basis of race. And so I think, um, so I, I, just, I wanted to be explicit that we are fully aware of the irony or the potential hypocrisy of talking about inequality in a group of, of members, mostly from advantaged groups, but that um, uh, at least one of my goals is to think about ways to continually diversify this conversation and also um, uh, think of ways in which we could create training opportunities where there are more uh, in individuals in influential positions where they can continue to contribute in that way. Um, uh, okay, so other sort of general things, which actually we've already talked about, um, which is I think this brings up, when we, when we start talking about intervention, interventions to mitigate inequality, um, there's a lot of underlying um, value-laden judgments about which inequalities are, are palatable or unpalatable for what reasons. So we think of inequalities on the basis of um, family socioeconomic status as unpalatable. We think of inequalities on the basis of genotype under some circumstances as maybe not problematic. But those two things are correlated. Some genetic effects are operating through the family environment. So I think this clean division of um, SES inequalities are bad, genetic inequalities are fine, is, is complicated theoretically, and I don't think those have been really underwoven. So I think as we're talking, thinking, thinking beyond just inequality or reducing inequality, we talk about inequality on the basis of what and what is actually the goal. Is the goal to reduce inequality? Are those inequalities necessarily you know, bad or the target? Um, and then I think getting back to Candace's question, 
um, you know, we talk about this idea of, you know, this, this fantasy in the future of personalized intervention. Um, and then one of the things that I think differentiates genetic information from phenotypic information is that one of them is about potential capabilities, potential outcomes, potential risks, potential deficits, and what is on, like, how the person is functioning in the here and now. I mean, I think those activate different um, concerns about whether it's fair to select people on the basis of what they might do in the future versus kind of how they're functioning now. So that's another kind of big meta question that I want to throw out there. Um, so we have, we, so I put on there working lunch and talking about like how this work plays out in, in a political context and a funding climate. Those themes are already kind of um, being interwoven into our conversation. So I feel like we're going to break out into groups, and um, you all have the time we had originally scheduled, but also through the lunch period, there's going to be tons of food. And so to what extent you still want to keep talking while you're eating versus to what extent you need a break and you want to check your email and you want to eat lunch and talk about something other than science, I leave that to your discretion. Um, <coughs> but I just wanted to talk, I mean, we wanted to talk about sort of norms about how this meeting should go. and I. This is somewhat unnecessary at this point because you've done this. Um, uh, and one is not being shy about voicing objections. Um, I think sometimes when you have two fields that are historically seen as conflict, the way that um, people have working relationships is to never <coughs> question the underlying assumptions of the other field and then you can get along well, um, which is really good for polite interdisciplinary meetings, but not really great all the time for thinking about, well, what are the barriers that are that are preventing these fields from, from integrating productively? So I think to the extent that um, you can continue to voice objections across fields, um, frankly, I think that's going to be helpful. Yeah, and to build on that, I think it, even if they're not objections that you personally have in your own work, but you know your fields will raise, it's helpful for everyone to hear what what the paradigm in your field would would say in response to such and such comment. Because uh, I think that will help all of us sharpen what we're doing and, and get on the same page. Um, you're already listening incredibly generously to each other, which is lovely. Um, and then the last thing is we don't want this to be an entirely pie in the sky exercise. We do want to talk to funders after this about um, what are the avenues for um, making this an actual research agenda. And so thinking about not just the what if questions, the big, the big ethical challenges, but also thinking about what sort of data would be necessary to resolve this, um, where are the methods limited, what do you think are the barriers to pitching this to funders, thinking pragmatically about how, what is pre preventing this from being you know, in the real world, something that people do. Yeah, and that's where Dan Candace's points I think are really well taken, to say like, well, okay, what's the, under the extreme version, there's no value. Right under another extreme version, yes, it should be every study. What's what's a, what's a what's a legitimate argument to make in the medium term? Okay. All right. So um, we're gonna break. We're gonna talk. We're gonna. Um, I will not instructions a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we sent we we'll, we sent some emails about this. What we were trying to do is group you with people who are like minded enough that you could talk about things. Um, but not so like-minded that you know exactly what the other person is already going to say. Um, and, <coughs> I mean, y'all are smart, interesting people that I think are going to take this in directions that we didn't envision. Um, but we, what we really want out of this is for you to surface ob ob objections and also points of productive tension and also ways in which your, your work might be converging that you can then bring back to the larger group and talk about what what did we think was the most important kind of contributions from our own work to the larger group. Right, so very concretely, we'd like you to meet with your groups for at least an hour and a half <laughs> and pull slides from the things you already have and educate the other groups about what your field has to say about these issues. We have tried to do our best of creating superficial versions of the conceptual problems, but now it would be helpful to um, clarify the room's language. Maybe if there are a couple key findings that you think really demonstrate a point that can give novices, people come just coming to your field, an anchor, 
to say, here's something everyone needs to keep in mind, rather than just in the abstract? What are a few findings, a few key concepts to educate the colleagues in the room so that we can um, sharpen the conceptual models beyond the kind of abstract versions we've shared so far? And when you have it, if you have a completed slide deck done, you can email it to Valerie and she will um, load it onto the computer. And then each group will get an hour and a half, so we're expecting that to be an interactive hour and a half where people are stopping you. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah.